I thought that was colorful. <laughs> he thanked me. Then we started talking about his kids again. <clears throat> you don't have, it's not rocket science, it's people work. It's people work. You never say to a trombonist, you're a bad trombonist. Well, they could have said it about me, but they always had to say, make it sound like the rest of them. You're, you're playing flat. You're not on tune. You're not moving with the tempo. You have to keep up. And so it was always with a sense of trying to bring my performance into what the rest of them were doing. All right? Now, the one thing that I did very well is I marched. I marched very well. And the trombones were always on the front line of the marching band. And everybody had to raise their knee up level 90 degrees with every step. It was sort of a pride thing. Mr. Ganegi was a former Marine, and he wanted everybody high-stepping every step, eight to the five. And because I was a good high-stepper, he put up with my, few, my limited musical skills, all right? <laughs> you have to use them where they <laughs> do the best job. And I happen to be on the front row, okay? Now, here's what it means for the team continuum. I want to go back to this. Because this will show you, my favorite you know, drawing is this teeter-totter, this one that brings balance. If you have a, a teeter-totter on this team's continuum where you're getting very little change or cooperation, it's usually because individuals within the body have their own vision and they don't really understand or appreciate or value those of a different position. They don't see themselves as being a part of a large, complex organization. They see themselves as more as dedicated individuals. All right? On the other side of the continuum, directly opposite, you will find that people who have a <coughs> fully developed sense of vision of what they want to accomplish and a sense of unity, not of complete identification. Nobody is going to play a trombone like me. And if your job is to play a tuba, you better not play like me. <laughs> and if your job is to be the piccolo player, you're in a whole different cleft of music than me. But we have to be unity, have to have a sense of unity, or we don't get the music taken care of. All right? The second line those who have a difficult time have very little personal awareness. Uh, don't tell me who I am. I already know who I am, but I don't really want to share it with anybody. All right? Now, what I've said to people in this fellowship right here, when we got organized right at the beginning, I broke you into four different teams of leadership teams, all right? Based on what I heard from you during those interviews in the early days, I heard your passion, I heard your personality, I heard your leadership abilities, I heard how you felt about things, and I tried to put you in places that you really felt passionate about. All right? And I said to you individually, this is who you are. Do you follow? It's true. Most of you said, okay, I agree, that's who I am. <laughs> I'm glad I'm in a plot, spot that I can serve. But that's because you're over here on this side. You have a high level awareness of what you can contribute. You're open to hearing how you fit in and how you can be a part of the overall ministry. But it isn't that way for people who are unaware of who they are and how they fit in. And so we have to be, we have to be flexible in order enough to know ourselves. All right, I'm going to go to the third one. 
Leadership by default or by position. Um, there are two kinds of leadership within the church. All right? One is elected positions of responsibility. Um, those who were in the advisory council meeting, they sit around the table because they were appointed to sit on that advisory committee. They were given a specific role. Does that make them any more important or any more powerful than people who don't sit on the advisory committee? No. No. It's just that they've been given a position that had to be responsible to take care of the business of the church. What you do get once in a while is someone who says, I've been given this responsibility, I was voted in here, and I will tell you what needs to be done. Now, you've never seen that happen, David. I know that's true. But it has in the past. Now, there's that elected responsibility, and then we call ad hoc responsibility. Ad hoc is a very interesting word, a phrase, and it means by sheer force of personality, you have this respect or this authority. Uh, I once had a Sunday school teacher who wasn't really elected to the council, but he had more power than any other person on the board. Because when there was a piece of business that had to be considered, they always went to this Sunday school teacher to see what they should do. Now you wouldn't think a Sunday school teacher by their position would have that sort of leadership, but as an ad hoc leader, when he disapproved, nothing happened. Ad hoc leadership, okay? And they do it with almost dictatorial authority and power. That will kill a team. That will shoot your team full of Botox. <laughs> Paralyze it. <laughs> because um, after five years of ministry, that same individual said, Bob's got to go. And Bob had to go. It's not a team decision, it was one person decision, and it killed the ministry of the church, the, the sense of shared ministry. When we are having a position where we're sharing responsibility based on our gifts and our abilities, the team thrives, okay? The team is built up because everybody gets to exercise their spiritual gifts and their personalities in an appropriate way. All right? It is liberating to be asked to be in leadership, to do what you love to do. You ever had that? Someone says, look, you're really good at this. You really enjoy this. Why don't you take this and make it happen? Sometimes it's small things. I once had a lady who had no, absolutely no leadership ability. She was not a gifted individual for leadership. She didn't have any other kinds of gifts that seemed to, to function within the church. And she came to me one day and she said, we're remodeling the church. The bathrooms are just awful. They are so boring. They are so drab. And I said, Jackie, guess what? I'm going to put you in charge of making those restrooms beautiful. Now, you would be insulted if I said that to you. Maybe. Jim, you'd be embarrassed about it. Yeah. But Jackie was thrilled. I get the freedom to do whatever I need to do to make this beautiful. And she did a gorgeous job. People love to wait in line to get in the bathroom. It was only a one-holer. You had to kind of take your turns, all right? But it was, it was the, she showed some interest, and all of a sudden, she was liberated to be able to do this work. Okay. <clears throat> Most of the time, someone who is doing dictatorial things is doing it on the basis of very limited trust. Does anybody else going to do this as good as me or in the same way that I will. Yes. Trust and control. Trust and control. You're exactly right. No exactly surprises. right. That way 
I'm never disappointed because I get a chance to do it any way I want to. <laughs> All right. But it also kills the team. It kills the sense of cooperation as we share together. Judy is always reminding me, always reminding me, find someone else to do that job. Find somebody else you put that in their hands to take care of. Because, believe it or not, I tend to be a person that says, needs to be done, let's just jump in and do it. Let's just jump in and do it. Not because I don't trust somebody else, because I just happen to be there first. She just keeps saying, delegate. Respect enough to let somebody else help you and be in a high trust relationship. That's what builds the team. <clears throat> I don't know whether you've ever had anybody try to manipulate you by coercion, by need, or by guilt. <laughs> it's not fun. <laughs> it's not fun. It can be very stressful. When someone is trying to sell you on something because they need to meet their needs and it's not meeting your needs and they're trying to get you to do what they want you to do by guilt or by insistence, by power, you feel used. Okay? Teams can be destroyed by manipulation. All right? Um, it's a bit of a story on myself right now. I used to be really, really good at getting people to do what I wanted them to do. In a most unchristian way. I had a very high success rate. And then I came to know the Lord <laughs> in a more personal and powerful way. And I can't do that anymore. I just can't. I keep saying, you pray about it and let the Lord guide you in what needs to be done. I will tell you how I feel. I'll tell you what I believe. But you pray about it. We're working on this together. And if the Lord doesn't convince you of it, I'm not going to. All right? It's almost like I had to go to the other end of the continuum, enlisted by gifts and skills and, coincidentally, the movement of God's Spirit. I only know one way to play it. I am God's man. He brought me here by the power of His Spirit. I don't care where you happen to be and where I think you might want to end up, but I'm going to let the Lord guide your heart and move you to where he wants you to be. You know what? Coincidentally, that makes working in teams a lot more fun. A lot more fun. There are <laughs> people who work with a very high personal agenda. That's down here, greed and position. What that means is, I know what I want to get out of this thing, and I'm going to try and keep what I want coming, what I want. Now, um, sometimes that's a pastor who just wants to keep the flow of income coming into their bank account each week. And so whether they take care of business or whether they don't, whether they love people or whether they don't, they're going to keep manipulating things around. I once had a pastor who spent 34 years in a church. He was their founding pastor. He'd gotten fired from his previous ministry, and so he engineered his church so that no one ever had a chance to vote him out. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. It was a wonderful concept, except the church is about ready to die. Okay? They needed the vitality of a new voice. But because he wanted it for himself, they couldn't. 
they had one picture. We have to keep this pastor in his role. There was never a vote. There was never any kind of way to challenge him or to say, could you do something a little differently? He was in control. All right? Um, the word that is on the other side is passion. But what I want to say to you about that is it's passion for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's passion for him, not passion for what I get out of it. Um, there's always a, a tension. Uh, I told the story one time about when I was going to my first full-time church. And uh, a part of the plan was that I got to build and live in a brand new parsonage. That was a part of the plan of the ministry of the church. I'd been, they had been having the pastor live in a small apartment in the church building itself. It wasn't a real good idea, and they needed the space for other offices and things in the church building, so they were going to build a house next door for the pastor to live in and turn the other spaces that had been parsonage into classrooms and things. Okay? And I had to ask myself, I have been living in a dump for two and a half years. Didn't even have central heat. Am I going to this church just because I get a chance to live in a nice house? And I prayed about it, and I prayed about it, and I prayed about it, and I prayed about it. And then one day at a chapel service, the Lord spoke to me. And he said, Bob, it's going to take months and months and months to build this house. You're going to be in that little apartment all those months. If that was the only thing that was making you make the decision to go to that church, you're not a very smart guy. But if that's not the only reason, it's okay that you enjoy being in a nicer house. It's okay. But that's not the reason you're going. See, I have to be sure that I'm not putting my needs first, but we're putting God's needs in, and then all of a sudden, I can serve without limits. I don't have to keep figuring out what do I have to do to keep staying in this house. Okay? <clears throat> in the next one, we're kind of doing two rows at a time. In discussion, debate, persuading, and avoidance. There are a lot of people who will just simply stay in control by not facing the issues. They just not have any meetings, won't attend, won't, won't be a part of it, won't open up for the discussion. But when we have the opportunity for dialogue questions, openness, and understanding, do you understand what that definition is? Those dialogue questions, openness, understanding. You know what that is? That's what we were doing Thursday night. It's called team building. Here's the entire spectrum of what we're planning on doing. Do you have any questions? Do you have any comments? Do you want to share what you have? We're open here. Uh, one of the phrases I used is, we're not railroading anyone. This is an open discussion, a dialogue. It's team building. It's team building when we can have roundtable discussions and congregational meetings where everything is put on the table. You want to see the financial statements? Fine, here's the financial statements. You want to see the minutes from the last advisory council? Here, here's the minutes to the last advisory council. You want to see what the plans are for next, next month? Here's the calendar for the meetings next month. You want to question how we're doing things? It's fine, it's safe, go ahead and ask. We'll give you the minutes of this team meeting or that team meeting, and here's what's being discussed. It's team building. Do we always get what we want? No. I mean, everybody has priorities, and it has, to be, it has to be a dialogue to get there. But if we're not willing to open up the discussion and actually give people a chance, the teams never develop. I have a very high priority on giving everyone a chance to have their voice heard. Bar none. Bar none. 
Will I agree with every one of them? Roy, am I going to agree with you every time? No. No. Even a good friend like Roy, I'm going to disagree with once in a while. It just isn't possible that you can agree on every... My, I had a friend once say, if we agree on everything, one of us is irrelevant. I could do it by myself. <laughs> or you could do it by yourself. It takes both of us. And so the discussion, the debate, persuading, avoiding, trying to manipulate things are team-killing patterns. And then resistance to learning and no spiritual vitality are the results of a poor team. All right? I'm going to do this real fast because I think this is cooler than the symphony. You may not recognize what I'm doing here, but there's our goal. This is the city that we're going to be conquering. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, this is a military campaign. Did you follow? This is a military campaign. This is the city we're going to set siege to. This is the goal we're going after. The cavalry is lined up over here. You know, the horse soldiers? It's, it's a different era, but it, you understand what I mean. And they're over here. They're ready to sweep in at a moment's notice because they're so highly mobile, they can just cover the ground instantly, and they're right in the middle wherever they're needed. All right? So you can hold them off to the side, and they're perfectly positioned to come sweeping in at exactly the right moment at the proper signal, all right? Here are all the foot shoulders right down here. There's the gate we're going to go through. We got hundreds of foot shoulders. We love foot soldiers. Infantry. <laughs> because they got the boots on the ground. They know how to get it done hand to hand. They can move forward on the ground effectively, all right? Behind them, we have the archers. They're just high enough that they can help open up the territory ahead of the foot soldiers with the weapons that can reach over and take out the defending troops and make it possible for us to get right up against the city walls that we're going to take. All right? Behind them, we have all the people with the siege works. The siege works are those great big catafalts that they throw, lob heavy objects up over the wall and into the city. They're the ones with the swinging battering rams that we can roll right up to the gates and start to punch a hole through the wall. These siege gates, these siege works, are the great big monster machines like they used to break through the wall at uh, Masada. They cranked it up the hill, all the way up the hill, until they finally got it in exactly the right place, and then they kept punching the battering ram until they broke through the wall. All right? Then we have the supply camps and the people who are taking care of feeding the troops and doing all the things, and there are safe sleep quarters and people who are taking care of washing the clothes and taking care of the normal routine type business. And they're back here where it's safe. Okay, which one's most important? <laughs> Marion hit it exactly nail on the head. The people who are providing lunch. And if we didn't have lunch, the troops would just fade out and be helpless. If they didn't have someone to bandage up their wounds, they wouldn't be able to heal up and get back in the battle. If we didn't have a place to put your head down and rest, you'd just get ex exhausted. And you would say, but that's worthless. It's clear in the back. You haven't shot a single arrow or taken one step forward to help anybody. You... Pretty important stuff. But I'll tell you what, you talk to an archer and he's proud of his ability, he believes he's the reason the army is winning. He believes that because he is spot on every time he lets one of those things fly, that everybody ought to be thanking him for winning the battle. The foot soldiers don't agree with that necessarily. They think they're the ones who are actually fighting the war and going hand to hand and slashing and cutting and trying to get their way through to the goal. And the cavalry, boy, you don't get a prouder bunch than that. 
We can ride through that. We can cut through the throngs of the enemy. We can just have our horses all at high speed and nothing can stand up to us. Each one of them is proud of what they have to contribute. Every one of the things that it takes to win the war feels like they have the most responsible position in the whole task. But the general knows the truth. The general knows if it was all cavalry, they never would win. Because somebody has to pound a hole in the wall and the cavalry can't do it. it. Takes the siege works. And the cavalry is vulnerable to the arrows from those defenders who are standing on the top of the wall. If we didn't have the siege works and the catafalts throwing those big fiery balls of whatever over the walls, the archers wouldn't have to keep their heads down and let the cavalry work. Now, I'm not a general. I'm just a preacher. But I can tell you a fact. I can't do the work and win the war if I only have the foot soldiers or the cavalry or the archers or the siegers or the cooks. I need every one of them. And the work of getting the word out to our community about the saving grace of Jesus Christ takes the entire team. It takes the entire army. In fact, it takes a bunch of the Navy too. Since I was a Navy guy, I have to throw that in. If you think for one second that I don't treasure you, if you don't think for one second that I am passionate in my support of you, you simply don't understand my job. My job is to empower you to do the very best that you've got to do. My job is to encourage you to just put another step forward, make it happen again. Let's do it better this time. Let's go forward. If you go back to the band, my job is to make every person an important part of the harmony of the orchestra. And if one person says, well, in the last piece of music, you did this and you made me hush up, and you, you kind of uh, said, don't not play so loud, it wasn't because I didn't like piccolos. Piccolos get really hard on my ears, all right? Piccolos are hard for me to listen to. But they play an important part in the score that we have to have in order to make the orchestra happen. So I will never say to a bassoon player, your job is not important. I'll never say to a guy who plays the timpani, take a vacation, I don't need you. Because everybody has to make this thing work. I just was out, to, Tom and Karen took me out to uh, uh, Handel's Messiah. And the whole orchestra was there and the choir and everybody involved. And I just, I get thrilled with that, it was wonderful. But the director was directing every single individual and wasn't forbidding anybody to be participating. He just told them all to make Handel's Messiah come alive. See, that's what we're doing here. That's why team building is so important. And we do a lot of the dialogue, we do a lot of the round tables in ways just so that you know every voice is valued and every voice is treasured. We're trying to encourage us to do better. Do you have any questions of me? That was the lesson I had for you today. Do you have any questions, comments, observations? <laughs> Isn't it great being in a family? <laughs> sure beats being alone. Are all hearts clear? Would you join with me in a word of prayer? 
Dear Jesus, we are yours. We are your people. We are your body. We are your family. We are your kingdom. And if you gave yourself for us, then we better treasure each other as well. And so we come to you saying, Father, open our hearts, open our minds. Allow us to be the people that we really are. Allow us to be honest. Allow us to share because we need you in order to make this church work well. And we need to have that, that hope for the future because we have to accomplish great deal in order to bring glory to your name and to build this church into something strong and vibrant so that we can honor you and glorify your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.